All right, I want to welcome everyone to our Sunday School lesson for September 29th, last Sunday of, of September. The title of today's lesson is Daniel Sees Future Kingdoms. The scripture reference we're going to be using is Daniel chapter 8, verses 19 to 26. I'll call on a few other scriptures as we go through just to help illustrate some points of the lesson. But before we get into it, let's go to God in prayer. Most holy and gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the service this morning to our to our littles, to our young, to our young adults and how you use a pastor to even teach us who are older about the importance of devoting our life to you. We ask you, Father, that you would come into this Sunday school lesson now, using me as a guide through this word. As we're going through this prophecy, give us clear clarity, give us understanding, let us know the things that are that have occurred, the things that are occurring, and the things that are to occur. For without your understanding, your interpretation, we will surely miss the mark. Ask that you would guide the listeners and, and those who are will be participating in the Sunday School to share what revelation you've likewise given to them. Father, uh, let us be able to take this lesson with us as we go and grow from it. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray all things. Amen. Amen. All right. Okay, so starting with the text, the golden text and the aim, the golden text is Daniel 8, 26, where it says, And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Therefore, or or as King James Version says, wherefore, shut up thou shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. We'll we'll talk on that as as we get to that portion of the text, which is our which will be our last scripture. The facts are to review details of Daniel's vision that teach us about the Antichrist figure of the last days. I'm actually, I will touch on that um, as we went through the book. Well, those of us who have, who have the Sunday School book, you'll notice that they, they touch on it, they talk on it, but there's no, like, there wasn't a lot of elaboration on it. And and likewise, as I go through the lesson, that I won't have a ton of elaboration on, on that, but I do want to point out some some parts of it where, We'll see through a historical figure some elements of of what we can expect whenever this antichrist is revealed. Now, the principle is to understand that God reveals His eternal plan to us to encourage and comfort us. I love that one. And the application is to pay attention to the truths God reveals to us in Scripture to find confidence in God's activity in history through prophecies that have already been fulfilled. And we'll touch on that quite a bit. Now, before we get into the lesson, there's a few keys to prophecy or, or even understanding prophecy. Um, there's a lot of prophecy in, in the Bible, obviously, and some of the prophecies are symbolic as this one will be, uh, and some are literal. That means, you, you know, literal, obviously you can look at it, you can read it, and literally what it says will happen, will happen. And just one example that I have of that, just so, you know, we can, we can all be clear and on the same page, 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 2 talks about a prophet that cries against the altar 
stating that a king or Josiah would come. I'll read that real quick. It says, and he cried against the altar, he, he being the prophet. doesn't say which prophet. It says a certain prophet. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. That's First Kings chapter 13, verse 2. I didn't look up when that was written. However, that becomes fulfilled in Second Kings chapter 23, verse 16. I'll read that real quick. And it says, And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchres that were there in the mount, and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchres, and burned them upon the altar, and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. Now what I did look up, I didn't look up the exact date, but I did look up that first prophecy in 1 Kings 13.2 was spoken three, approximately 300 years later, the, the prophecy was fulfilled in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 16. So that's one. That's an example of a, of a literal something is spoken that will that God has proclaimed, and then everything that's spoken is taken literal, and it occurs literally. Um, so that's just one, and then we'll we'll talk about the about the symbolic here in in a bit. But symbolic is, is just to give a, a precursor. Is there's things that are spoken in the prophecy that you can't take literal. You you can't. Uh, like, like I'll just give a, a quick one now. Talks about a ram coming and and doing all this damage. Well, it wasn't a literal lamb; it was symbolic, and we'll get into that. Then another key to prophecy is a single fulfillment or a dual fulfillment. Single fulfillment is it's pretty straightforward. That's like the prophecy of Josiah that I just read. It's talking about a, a man shall come named Josiah. He shall do this and that. And a man named Josiah came, and he did this, this, and that. That prophecy was fulfilled. End of story. No need, no need to further di dissect that prophecy. It's been fulfilled. Dual fulfillment is either, and, and you may hear other terms, um, but I just, I like the, I like the idea of single versus dual. I mean, obviously, single is one, dual is two, obviously. Um, but you might hear other terms, and I, I forget what the there's another term that that talks about dual fulfillment prophecies. But there's a short term fulfillment or near term fulfillment, and then there's a long term fulfillment. Um, one example of that, and I won't read it just for the sake of time, is in Second Samuel chapter seven, verse eleven through thirteen. You can go read that if if you desire. But this is a uh, Samuel is prophesying regarding David's successor who will build a house for God. Now, in the short term, we know that Solomon built that, that a house for God. But there's another part to it where he talks about through this offspring or, or through this person, the successor, that shall come, he will make a, his throne to be established forever. Well, Solomon's throne is done. It no longer exists. So that was talking about Jesus. So you see there's a short-term fulfillment of prophecy in Solomon, but you see the longer-term fulfillment is really that of Jesus. So in some, some, some prophecies, they'll have, they'll have this concept of a dual fulfillment where something will be done, you know, kind of immediately, taking, part, taking care of parts of it. But then there's other parts that is a longer term fulfillment, uh, whether it's of end times or whether it's sometime later talking about Jesus or, or who, who, whatever the case may be. This particular prophecy that we'll be reading is both symbolic and it has <laughs> elements of single and dual fulfillment. And we'll get into that. So, uh, I think hopefully that's enough of an introduction um, and some keys to prophecy. Let's go ahead and get into the lesson. In the book, it's called Future Kings, uh, and the chap chapter we'll be reading is Daniel chapter 8, 
verses 19 to 22 will be the, the first verses we read. Would someone be so kind to read those four verses for me? Hey, Damien, I can read it. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I'm, I'll be reading from the uh, Sunday School book here. And uh, verse 19 reads, And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. Verse 20, The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And then verse 21, And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And then the last verse, verse 22, Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Thank you. All right, so let's let's get into this. Um, verse 19 as it's written, it says, and he said, behold, and, and then, you know, the rest of, the, of what it says. The he in that is, is Gabriel. Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, he appears multiple times throughout the, or at least a couple times throughout the Bible. Obviously, he came uh, a bit later and, and spoke with uh, Mary, the, the Virgin Mary, mother of Jesus, right? But he was sent to show Daniel this interpretation. So, so the he in that in that verse, that's all we know is Gabriel. Now, this prophecy was written approximately 550 BC, according to our book. It says 551, about 551 BC. We'll just say approximately 550 BC is when this occurs. Now, that's a bit important because we need. We need evidence to to know that what we read is true. Now, we believe it as Christians, but for those that might be younger in the faith, you know, you, these God gives these historical references and showing, hey, this was written, you know, 150 years before, 200 years before, 300 years before, and then it carries out exactly as is written. It's important to know that so that you can have faith in the things that have not occurred yet that they are going to come to pass. Now, so the prophecy is written in five, approximately 550 B.C., and but it it starts at approximately 539 B.C. 539 B.C. is when Babylon was conquered by Cyrus. That's when the Medes and the Persians, uh, the Medes and the Persians took over. So even just from the start, the very first thing that, that Daniel saw about this ram that he saw and, and it being the kings of Media, Media and Persia, that was at least 11 years from the time when he started writing the prophecy. So, and this is where we start to see that symbolism. And thank God that he gave us an interpretation because if he didn't, who knows? We might still be trying to guess what is he talking about, about those two horns that Daniel saw. What is this? What's going on? But God gave us gave us the interpretation through the acts of, of Gabriel so now that we understand. Now, the ram is obviously symbolic. It's thought. Uh, now, the reason why God may have used this as I was studying through the in Medo Persia, they thought the ram to be a bit of a spirit animal. And uh, from what I read through various encyclopedias and sources, and when as they headed out into battle, they would wear a ram's head into battle. So perhaps that's why God referenced them as a as a ram. Uh, now it it doesn't talk well. It does actually it does. I'm sorry. It does talk about how the rams had two horns. The two horns represent the two different kings at, at that time of, of Media and Persia. Um, but if you go back up to Daniel 8 and 3, we're not going to do it for the sake of time, but it talks about how one horn was higher than the other horn. Uh, the reason for that was because between Media and Persia, 
Persia was the actually the stronger empire, and it's the one that actually became more uh, in, uh, influential during that period of time. Now, as you go to verse 21, it talks about now there's this goat that pops onto the scene. And again, it's symbolic. It's not an actual goat. It represents the king of Grecia. Now, as I was reading about this, perhaps one of the the reasons why God referenced it as a goat or Daniel had this vision of the goat that God obviously gave to him was because a goat was a key part of Greek mythology. Uh, it was one in one element it was taught about it was thought that the foster mother of Zeus, one of the gods that they worshipped, was a goat. Uh, that that mother that m mothered Zeus. Um, they also use satire, satires, s a t y r s. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Satires, which was essentially a form of a goat man, half goat, half man. And they thought these were nature spirits. So perhaps because of some of this, God referenced them as a goat, be because of you know how how they reverenced goats in their Greek mythology, but. So we know this is Greece, because it tells us, and this great horn that came out is King Alexander, or Alexander the Great as we know it. Now, this jumps ahead to 336 B.C. So the, the first part about, you know, the Medes and Persians basically coming into power occurred in 539 B.C., we jumped Almost 200 years later, Alexander the Great now takes over, conquers the Persian Empire. So we got another big gap there. Now, uh, he was this great horn that was talked about in verse 21, the first king. Then, as we get to verse 22, it talks about now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. The four, when Alexander the Great, and this this is amazing how accurate this really is. It's so accurate that you know doubters think that somehow either Daniel wrote this afterwards or some other author wrote this prophecy after. It all occurred because it, it occurs with such accuracy is just uncanny. Um, but we hold true and we hold to the faith that Daniel wrote this before, and because we serve a God who knows the beginning from the uh, the end from the beginning, he doesn't have to worry about writing later. He can tell you what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next year into the end of humanity. He knows all things. There's nothing that gets past him. So we can hold true to that. We don't have to be, we don't have to doubt just because it's so accurate. It should be accurate because we serve a real God. We serve, we serve the real God. But anyhow, in 321 BC, so 15 years after Alexander the Great, you know, conquered Persia, he ended up dying. And then his four generals divided his kingdom through war. And so there was a Ptolemaic kingdom. The, Tol the, the General Ptolemy, he ruled over Egypt. Uh, there was a, a Seleucid kingdom. They ruled over Syria and Israel. Uh, there's a general named Cassander. He ruled over Greece, or, or what is often called Macedon. And then, hopefully I'm pronouncing this right, is Lysimachus, L-Y-S- I M A C H U S. That was the fourth general, and he ruled over Pergamon in Asia Minor. Now, when it talks about not in his power, but not in his power, once his king, once Alexander the Great had, he had supreme rule o over that area. But when these four broke up, they didn't have that same type of rule. So what? is thought to believe there is not in the power lens to mean that they didn't have the same authoritative level. So this part of the the prophecy has been fulfilled. And 
this essentially is a single fulfillment because we were told exactly what happens. And if you go back and you just look at the history of these, you can you can map it out. You can get the dates, you can get the times, and you can get how it, it matches pretty much word for word this prophecy, uh, this part of the prophecy. Um, so that for now, that's really all I have. And for this section. Um, does anybody else have anything else that they may have gotten from this or anything that they want to add, uh, whether from a historical perspective or from a spiritual pers perspective? Well, I was going to add that from a historical perspective, there's a story in, or it's written in Josephus' um, Antiquities of the Jews, his, his history of the Jewish people, that Alexander the Great had visited Jerusalem and he was shown the prophecy about the, the, the Greeks in the book of Daniel, this particular prophecy. And he had a, a tentative agreement with uh, Persia not to attack them. But uh, he wanted uh, something in, he wanted something in Egypt and on his way there, he was going to be passing through Syria, and you know, which is part, you know, where the Persians of, you know, Iran, Iraq, you know, that whole area there. He had his army based there. He had went to Jerusalem because he was looking for uh, arms, and what was the other thing? He was looking for arms and and I guess tribute from the from the Jews there, even though they were under Persian rule at the time. He wanted something from them, and he was shown this by the high priest Jada. Who, and he, when he read it, he he realized it was about him. Now this was written about almost three hundred years before he was born, and it influenced him. And eventually, he did attack them, and eventually he conquered them. It took him um, some time, but he did do that. And I thought that was really interesting. I don't know. It's not written about in uh, secular history. Right. And maybe because if it was written there, then it would be, how would you explain that God's not involved in this? Right. Where a prophecy that was written 300 years before this particular person was born influenced his decision to attack a nation and succeed. Yeah. So, you know, that, you know, when I was reading, the, you know, I was reading the, the lesson that the, you know, I, I was looking for other things. You know, I was, I'm always curious, and so I found that, and I thought, dude, this is really interesting. It just shows, you know, the power of God and, and how some people would rather, you know, not be accountable, so they overlook it. That it's more likely to be true than not true. Amen. Amen. No, that's, that's uh, and then... I tend to believe I know Jos I don't know a lot a ton about Josephus, but I do know he's you know considered to be a, a very accurate historian and and use his reference you know to just I guess I'd say justify many many things that happened to the Jews, particularly things that happen according to Scripture. So uh, I I believe it. Um, you know the other thing, and I didn't write it down, but. Uh, there's, I know the Maccabees have have some form of of history book or, or, or writings that that detail some of the things that went on during this this time as, as well. Um, and oh, yeah. I saw some references to it. I didn't write them down, but you know that's another source that you know if if you so choose. And I'm not just talking to to, to Deacon Harry. I'm talking to whomever will. Uh, if you so choose, I know you can go and look at some of their writings and, and see that, you know, pertaining to this prophecy in particular, there's some very good detail in there that that really exemplifies, yeah, God's in control and and all this all this occurred to the teeth. Oh, oh yeah, the Book of Maccabees is in the Catholic Bible. Yeah, I grew up with it. Yep. Yep. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right, we'll continue to go to, to progress along. Um, we'll go to where it talks about fearsome king, Daniel chapter 8, verses 23 to 24. Is there someone so kind to read these two verses for me? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. 
Okay. Uh, 23 and 24. I'm in the ESV. Okay. Uh, verse 23. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. Thank you. Okay, so this part of the prophecy is another big jump. Now remember, this was start this was written approximately 550 BC. We jumped to, you know, just shortly thereafter, around 539 BC, we jumped to approximately 336 BC. Now we're making another jump to approximately 175 BC. So we have a gap of approximately 150 years between two verses. And this king of fierce countenance is understood to believe Antiochus Epiphanes or Antiochus IV. Now, there is a lot I could have written down about him. I'll, I'll just bring out some things. And, uh, you know, it, it is very interesting how uh, afflicting he was uh, or, or how much persecution he made to the Jewish people. But he gained the throne by murdering his brother and having his brother's son held hostage in Rome. Now, he was, he was definitely a very evil man. Again, I'll bring out some, some de details or some, some points of it. And some, some others may have some other details or some others that they may want to add on about him. But one thing that his his he was actually Antiochus the fourth, so he was like the fourth line of of Antiochus to become king, and he changed his name to Epiphanes, which means glorious or illustrious one. Essentially, he was trying to tie himself to to God. He was trying to tie himself to deity. Now he was so he persecuted the Jews so much the Jews took his name, uh, Epiphanes, and they actually referred to him, to him as Epimanes. Uh, help, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. So you can, well, if you can see my screen, you can see Epiphanes, but it's spelled E-P-I-P-H-A-N-E-S. And they called him, close to it, E-P-I-M-A-N-E-S, Epimanes instead of Epiphanes. Uh, and that meant madman. He came into power, or well, I should say he came into power. He he as part of his way to solidify his kingdom was through flattery and through bribes uh, to to not only other nations but also to religious organizations, and and we'll talk about that in just a bit. But when it talks about in verse. 24, he shall stand but not by his power. I mean, this guy was was definitely empowered by Satan. Uh, he was, or he, he was guided by Satan. Now, I'm not saying Satan has all power because he was permitted by God. Satan can't do anything without God allowing it. But for whatever reason, to persecute the Jews or to, to express his anger towards the Jews. God allowed this to happen. But when it, I believe when it talks about it not by his own power, it's talking about he, he shall stand by the power of Satan. Um, he had a goal to expand his idolatrous worship. Uh, he imported his own priests in place of the priests of God, uh, whom he bribed those priests to even you know, set up, help help establish uh, his Hellenization, which which we'll get into on the, on the next slide. But there's a little bit of a dualism here. So while part of this prophecy 
definitely talks about Antiochus Epiphanes. There's a bit of a dualism here in, in Antichrist. So so remember what I said about dualism or, or the, uh, this duality of prophecy. There's a near-term uh, fulfillment and there's a longer-term fulfillment. As we get into, uh, on the next slide, as I, as I talk to you a little bit about some of the things that Antiochus did, you know, you'll see, like, some of the things that he did are some of the things that are going to be talked about about the Antichrist when he comes and reveals himself. But just to highlight, hit some highlights of it, he elevates himself, he's holy against God's people, and he privily ushers in idolatry. Antiochus fulfilled all of these, but the Antichrist shall, shall fulfill all of those as well. Um, so that's what I have about this part for now. Uh, does anybody else have anything else that they want to talk about regarding these two verses? Okay. All right, we will go forward into uh, the final king, which, which is Daniel chapter 8, verse 25 to 26. And uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and read these. That's fine. And I could read, read it for you, Dan. Oh, okay. Okay, that's fine. Go ahead, Lois. That's fine. Okay. Okay, verse 25. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Thank you, Lois. You're welcome. So, Talking first on Antiochus, his his objective was to Hellenize the kingdom. Hellenize just means that he he wanted all of the of the Greek influence to be throughout all the kingdom. Now, I I'll say obviously, the the Jews were rule, were to be ruled by God. And the Greeks, they didn't reverence God. They reverenced gods, plural, multiple. And they didn't reverence the, the God of the Jews, you know, Zeus and Athena and, and, and others, Jupiter. In fact, Antiochus, he built temples for Zeus in Athens, he built, and he built a temple for Jupiter, Capitolinus, in Antioch. And he went about establishing cities that he called... Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing this right, Ep Epiphania, E-P-I-P-H-A-N-I-A. -I -I it's a play on epi epif Epiphanies. So maybe it's, it, I don't know. I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but I'm just going to say Epiphania. Um, but these were cities uh, that he, he set up in di various different places, and he allowed them, he, he had them to promote the, the Greek worship system and he also allowed them to mint their own currency. Now, from a religious perspective, that's not a huge deal. But from how you, you can help, you know, get the trust of people, you basically let them kind of set up their, their own community underneath your rulership that as long as they're serving these ways, you'll give them some sense of freedom. So he's using... You know, almost some some bribery, some some sense of peace, and and that kind of thing to to spread this Hellenizing of the kingdom. Well, this uh, caused some challenges with the Jews because I, I don't think the minting of the currency and that kind of thing caused problems, but obviously the other parts of of what he tried to take away the worship uh, of God. Um, there's talk of him going into the temple and defiling it by sacrificing a pig upon the altar. So all of these things were were very problematic to the Jews. And 
as this Hellenizing was going on, there were two sects of Jews that 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 uh, surfaced. There was the Reformed Jews, which they called the Hasidians, H A S I D E A N S, Hasidians, which means pious ones. And then there were other Jews who were, you know, they're supposed to be Jews representing God, but they they supported these Hellenizing efforts. Now that, as I was reading this and, and understanding it, I'm like, man, that, that's a lot like today, where we we have. Christianity, and you have to make a decision on: Are you going to follow what the Word of God says? And you know, Pastor gave an example today. There's only two uh, sexes in in the world: there's male and female. You can't go and be a male and then decide you you're going to be a female. That that doesn't work. Um, so, are you going to stick with that? Or are you going to follow what the government says and or or what society says as far as yeah, you can decide what you want to be. And so that was a little bit what was going on back back then. Now, at first he gave the Jews freedom to worship their God, but then he came and, and took, took that all away because they weren't supporting his efforts. He ended up replacing the priests uh, with his own forms of priests who would go and they would do all kinds of ungodly sacrifices in, in the temple, and they served... They brought in, you know, idolatry worship and all kinds of different things. So, you know, and verse 25 talks about, and through his policy, also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Um, you know, the, it, some sense of that was fulfilled by Antiochus and all these things that he did. But we see that there's this dualism is actually continued because while he did a lot of these things, it's talked about of the Antichrist who will come and do a lot of these same types of things. He'll come, he'll perform great works. He'll come starting in peace. You can read this, I believe, in Daniel chap chapter 9, and, and I may read one of the verses um, here, of course. But He'll come in peace, but then he'll break that peace. Uh, he'll bring in idolatrous worship. He'll stand, but not in his own power. So, so let's look at some of these some of these dualisms. Um, talks about the abomination of desolation in, in Daniel chapter nine, verse twenty-seven. And this is anyone who's, who's read through Daniel, you know, this is talks of, talks about the seventy weeks during that uh, when when uh, Jeremiah's spoke about it, but Daniel was given the understanding of it. And in 927 it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, you know, you can look at this and you can say, well, this was fulfilled in in Antiochus because he came in and peacefully and he ended up defiling and, and caused the temple sacrifice to stop. But but Jesus also referenced this in Matthew chapter twenty four verse fifteen, where he says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. And then he, he goes on, I'm not going to keep reading. You can, you can read that on your own as you, as you have time, as you desire. But now we know clearly Matthew was written after Daniel, clearly. Uh, we know Jesus clearly came after Daniel. So, and we know that Matthew and Jesus came after Antiochus Epiphanes. So if Antiochus Epiphanes fulfilled that, then why would Jesus bring it up saying, hey, when you shall see? Well, wait a minute. If he, if I shall see, then it couldn't have been something that already occurred. So so that's where we say, you know, there's a, there's a bit of this dualism. Yes, in a, in a sense, Antiochus fulfilled part of this, but there's another part where that has not yet been fulfilled says he'll magnify himself. 
and we can read you can read in second Thessalonians two and thirty four. I guess I'll I'll flip there uh really quickly, look like we're doing pretty good on time. So I'll read that as I find it. Bear with me just a moment. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is talking about the Antichrist that shall come. And again, if we're looking at uh, you know uh, history and, and succession, Second Thessalonians was written by Paul, who was after Jesus died. So it can't have been something that occurred in the past. So we're we're waiting for this to be revealed. But it, even Paul references he shall magnify himself in in the seat of God. Yes, Antiochus did a sense of that. But that's not completely, he does not completely fulfill this prophecy. Likewise, if you continue to read in 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, and I, since I'm already there, I'll go ahead and read these verses 9 and 10, talks about he'll stand in the power of Satan. Or, or as if you go back up to 24, I believe it was, it, he shall stand but not by his own power. Well, he's standing under the power of Satan. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10 says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now, as all of this could potentially sound scary, particularly to, you know, someone who's new to the faith. But we who have, who are more experienced, we first off we have to teach and encourage them. Um, but we also know that this is not the end of the story. Yes, there's going to be some hard times that come for a people of of, of God. Uh, it's not likely to, it may occur in our lifetime, it may not occur in our lifetime, but regardless, we don't have to fear because we're told he shall be broken without hand. Now Antiochus, he died of an unknown inflicted disease and, and the Jews, who, when they heard about it, they proclaimed it to be, you know, a curse of God. And they were, they're likely right. If you go back and look through a lot of the evil kings of, of that of that time, you know, they typically died in some harsh ways, uh, whether by some sort of disease striking them down or, or whether through some gruesome death. Uh, either way, God exercised his, his anger upon them in, in some, some form or fashion. And even this, and I mean, and if you think about what happened to them, what do you think is going to happen to this Antichrist. Yes, God is using that situation for his glory, for his purposes, but even when even when Judas was about to offend, to betray Jesus, Jesus said, Woe unto the man that <laughs> that shall betray the Son of Man. So what do you think is going to be the, the woe is going to be of, of this individual that, that comes and told himself? But we're told in, in Revelation 19, 11 through 21, again, that's a lot of scripture, so we're not going to read that, but Jesus destroys the Antichrist and the beast, casts them into the lake of fire. So that should be an encouragement for us. As, as, as scary as some of these things potentially may sound, we know that we serve a God who will keep us, who will protect us, and even if we shall die for the sake of Christ, we will, we will yet be with him. Now the rest, is hidden. You know, as we get to 26, it talks about, you know, uh, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. We don't know, and we really don't know anymore until God fulfills it for us, or, or until God fulfills it and tells it, reveals it to us. 
Um, so I have just one more slide just talking about some of the practical points or reviewing the practical points of the lesson. But I'll pause here if anybody has anything else that they want to bring up again from a historical or a spiritual perspective, either way, um, that you got from the lesson. Yes. I just want to say, in, in reading this lesson, you know, in the beginning, it was kind of confusing, you know, to figure out what was going on. But overall, once I got over to this, uh, the overall gist of it that sunk in with me was, you know, over in that section where they talk about uh, the practical points of our lesson and then yes. the uh, illumination. I'd like to reference number two and number four in that practical point. Number two says, kingdoms rise and fall, not of their own accord, but subject to God's purposes. And then the number four said, evil is given a time to strut, but it will be destroyed in due course. And it just sort of reinforces, you know this in your mind, but sometimes with your day-to-day -day activities, you kind of put it uh, out of your mind that everything that's going on, God already knows it's mm -hmm. happening. He knows what the outcome would be. And if we could just get ourselves so that we accepted that and know being a child of God, he's always looking out for our good, then we can begin to have uh, that peace that Pastor was talking about when he was referencing Philippians this morning. And it's, it's a hard thing to do when you're going through a lot, but it still comes down to the fact that in in due time, God's plan is going to come about, and his plan is always good. So, And it kind of goes along with what we see happening now in our world that we're in. It's a lot of confusion to us, but it's not confusing to God because he already knows what the outcome is going to be. Amen. Amen. That was very well stated, Lois. And and you're right. It It is, uh, there is a lot of confusion going on, um, but I can't remember where it's, where it's written. I believe Jesus said it, um, but I, I don't remember where. He talked about, you know, he was revealing a lot of things that would happen in, in the end days and after he, he left. And he says, you know, I've told these, th I've told you these things uh, a bit. So I'm paraphrasing. He told us these things so we would have some comfort, so that they, we would know that they come to pass, that they came to pass before he even said it. Um, and even this is an, it should be encouraging for us. I, I love the two points, and and I've, I've gone ahead and shown the the five points on my slide for wh whomever can see it. I'll I'll read them off at, when we, as we get to it. But, um, you know, even this should be a bit encouraging because mm -hmm. think think about it. If all this stuff was going on, and Jesus just came like, hey, I came to to give you life more abundantly, and you know, I came to die for your sins, and then he just died and didn't tell us in, anything. I mean, I, I'm, you know, that we, we don't have this situation, but I just want you to think about that for a moment. Imagine he didn't tell us anything that was going to happen afterwards. And then we have all this craziness. We'd be like, okay, I, I, I believe Jesus died for me, but what in the world is going on? But he's like, I told you, so you're not surprised. And, and so you you know what's to come. And and that if these things come, and my word, and you know my word is true, then you know that mm -hmm. when you die, when when you leave this earth, you know, believing in me, you know you're going to have eternal life with me. So, mm -hmm. I, I love yeah, what you exactly. Said. Yeah. It, any anybody else? I I haven't gone into to the reading all the practical points yet. I'll I'll review the two that that Lois said, and I'll read the other three. But anybody else have anything else from the from the lesson? Okay. Hey, Damien, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that you know what's interesting about you know as we go through the lesson is that although there's a lot that you know, God chooses to reveal to us and still some things come 
mm. that I feel that won't be revealed until, you know, we experience God in all of his glory. And, you know, I like how you brought up that, you know, chose to you know, let us know, and, you know, have insight about, you know, what's to come and, and what he's going to do. So I think it also just shows just how much he loves us, that yeah. he would send it through Daniel, he would send it through some of the other prophets, and he would also tell us to Jesus, and then even for the future, right, all the way down to us, you know, that he's still doing it even to this day, right? You know, yeah. like, I mean, we've got it, stuff going on today with the wars and, you know, all the stuff going on. And I still think God is even speaking, even now, to prepare us, like you said, so that we're not surprised, right? So when exactly. we freak out about a lot of this stuff, you know, we're we're not we're not surprised. You know, we we we're prepared. You know, during these times, to still you know bring God's glory to uh, to to the earth and, and to share the gospel. You know, even during these times. So, so I I, I like how how you tied it in there of just you know he chooses to do so to to let us in on it. And helps us mm-hmm. to stay prepared and ready, you know, for these times. Amen. Amen. Yep. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and uh, the interesting thing as you're as you're talking about that, you know, talking about you know Jeremiah had a vision of seventy weeks, and Daniel Daniel talked of it. Jesus talked about elements of it. Elements of it talked about in Revelations through. Uh, the Apostle John, who wrote that, well, he, 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 yeah, he wrote it. Obviously, he was given the vision by, the, you know, uh, by Jesus. But, but anyhow, um, the point that I was going to make is it's, it's interesting how God is so true to his word that even of himself, he adheres to his word. What I mean is, he says, you know, like if we have... Let let something be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. And God just saying at one time is good enough. Now, whether we like it or not, God saying at one time is good enough. He, he He's not like, like us as we talk to our children. You have to say it, you know, two or three times. How many times I got to tell you clean your room, right? <laughs> I mean, we have to sometimes say it multiple times. But God God does not have to say it multiple times. He only has to say it once. In the beginning, God mm-hmm. created the heaven and earth. He said, let there be light. He didn't say, come on, light. How many times I got to say, let there be light? Like, no, he said one time, <laughs> boom, it's done. But because he's so true to his His word, he's so faithful to us, he mm-hmm. said like two, three, four times through through the mouth of various different people at different times. So <laughs> and that's as you were talking about that, uh, Minister Scott, that's what I was, was thinking of. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and read the, and this will be the last section I have. I'll open up one last time if anybody else has anything else they want to add. But the practical points uh, of this lesson are without authoritative interpretation, visions may provide little insight. We Again, we you can get that through verse 19. We saw where Gabriel had to come and give interpretation to Daniel. Um, this is this is the Daniel who had uh, understanding of, of dreams, right? Right. All given by the authoritative interpretation of God. Kingdom, as uh, Lois read, kingdoms rise and fall not of their own accord, but subject to God's purposes. We have seen the rise and fall of, of numerous kingdoms. Whether we we read it, you know, and 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 a bit now, and you could you know you could look at. You know the kingdom of the U.S. Yeah, it, it's maybe at, at a at, at a high point. Is it at its highest point? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. That that could all be argued. But at some point, the U.S. is going to fall. And um, you know, so we, we can't have our faith in government because at some point it's going to be wiped away. You can't have your faith in NATO uh, uh, or you know the United Nations or whatever. Uh, it's going to fall. In God's time, so you can read, you get that from verses twenty and twenty-two. Uh, we, ver, uh, number three, we should not be surprised or alarmed at the prosperity of wicked rulers. Verses twenty-three to twenty-four, we've seen that through history. We, we again, we still see it now. Still goes on today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we yeah. don't have to be surprised or alarmed about it. 
because I, I remember David talking about this, and I can't remember what psalm it was, but he's like, man, I can't. You know, he almost slipped, but when he walked into the house of the Lord, then he understood their end. And that's what we gotta what we gotta understand. Those without Jesus, they may they may it may seem like they have it really good here, but mm -hmm. they, they got a they got a poor price to pay, a, a bad price to pay eventually. And and the other thing that's interesting is that even as we see those who have millions, billions of dollars, you know, we see some crazy stuff happening to them. Which, which goes <laughs> that's right. Money is not money doesn't doesn't do it all. Money doesn't give you all the happiness. It doesn't give you peace. Diddy just got arrested. We all saw that. So I mean, oh, Lord. I mean, it, yeah. You know, yeah. So that they'll they'll have their time. Uh, number four, as Lois read, evil is given a time to strut, but it will be destroyed in due course. Now, that kind of ties in to number three. We shouldn't be surprised or alarmed. Just, they'll, they'll, they'll have their time. And then lastly, even with the revelation, we will not understand all that will take place in God's plan and purpose, as Jimmy said, until God reveals it at the last day. Mm-hmm. So that concludes the lesson that I had. I'll open up one last time, any, and we're right at 11.30. So any other final comments? Hey, Danny, I was going to say is, uh, I think we had a great lesson today. Like I said, I, I think it really puts a lot into perspective for us. It, it, and this is knowing of the times, right, and, and then having those expectations of the business that we're able to do, I think it really brings back to like I said, us us being prepared and knowing you know, where we are at these times and pulling us closer together too. Uh, some uh, it could it could bring us a little bit closer together so that you know we know what's happening. And we ourselves as a family, as children of God, can even come more together. In Okay, thank you. Got got most of it. It was a little bit little bit uh low, but I, I, I got I got what you're saying. So thank you. Okay, well if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and pray out and we'll wrap up this lesson. Most holy and gracious Father, we thank you for this prophecy and though while it's at times a bit challenging to hear and a bit challenging even to understand we, you give us comfort and you give us confidence and you give us peace that you will keep us, you will sustain us, and that we're not to let anything deceive us or uh, to pull us away from you. We thank you, Father, for, for leading us through this lesson. Thank you for how you used me. I didn't know how it was going to go in the beginning because it, it is a little bit, this is a little bit stretching me as far as my understanding, and but I, I thank you for how you, you've led me and how you've confirmed uh, through the voice of those present. Now keep us as we go throughout this week. Guide us, continue to guide us in your truth, and let us show forth your light through our lives that others might ask what they must do to be saved from this evil and, and dark present world. May the love Amen. of God save and grace us saving grace of your son, Jesus Christ, and keeping power of your Holy Spirit. Be with us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.